Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. In the last part, we left Clock Town for the first time and made our way all the way through the Southern Swamp, dealing with the Deku Palace in the meanwhile. And now it's time for us to approach the temple of this particular area, our first real dungeon of the game. Those are dragonflies, by the way, uh, which is spelled like dragonflies, but I think that like one of the letters was changed. Uh, they can be kind of annoying. I'm stuck in the flower for some reason. Link, there we go. Uh, they can be kind of annoying to damage for the most part, but that's only if you don't realize something very interesting about Deku Flower properties. When you are ascending out of a Deku Flower, uh, you're counted as an active hitbox and cannot be damaged. You have complete armor frames during it, and it's ridiculously good at killing enemies like that. Oh, this is a rare sight. You are a fairy child, correct? What business might you have in this poisoned swamp? If you dare not venture further, I shall pass no judgment. It is better that you hurry back to town. This swamp you are in has lost its guardian deity, but it was destined to fade anyway. Ooh. And that destiny is not solely limited to this swamp. If you have the courage and determination to proceed in the face of destiny, then I shall teach you something useful. Before coming here, had you not seen any of the stone statues that bear close resemblance to me? I have placed those throughout the land to aid the one with the power to change the destiny of this land. Wherever he may appear. If you have left proof of our encounter on any of those stone statues, then the song carved at my feet will certainly be of some assistance. Remember it well, and play it wherever the need arises. From the first time you play this song, we shall become eternal friends, transcending time and place. Alright. Notes are carved in the stone. May the soaring wings take flight. the Song of Soaring. This melody swoops you up and sends you soaring to a stone bird statue in an instant. It's what it says on the tin. It is pretty box standard fast travel. You can now go back and forth between any owl statues in an instant without having to walk that far distance. Uh, notably, there were some owl statues that had slight location changes in the 3DS version. On top of that, they actually moved where that cutscene with Kipora Gibora was just there to the very entrance of Southern Swap on top of that. And as I mentioned before, since the Song of Time no longer saves in the 3DS version, Owl statues are how you do your hard saves. On top of the added quill statues, which are just owl statues that you can't fast travel to, usually the entrances of dungeons or every couple of loading zones. With that said, welcome to Woodfall proper. Uh, this is the destination of our dungeon overall, and uh, there's actually some pretty annoying enemies here. I think these things are called like hip loops or something like that. They will charge at you, and they are a little annoying that they actually take two. Uh, snot bubbles to take out, and that's easily the most efficient way to take them out, because, uh, frankly, we don't have a good enough way to take care of them as Hylian Link right now. Also, uh, getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but on an upcoming platform, there is the second owl statue for the Southern Swamp. By and large, every area in the game has two owl statues to it in some form. Uh, the moment you open that one up, I actually recommend traveling back to the entrance of Southern Swamp, and going back into the tourist center, because you can turn in the picture of the Deku King at this point for a piece of heart. To be completely honest, I frequently forget that you can't turn that in after you beat the dungeon, so make sure you do that now. Isn't this the Deku Scrub Mark? I wonder if they worshipped here. Well, maybe, either way. Uh, Owl Statue, yes please. Again, go to Southern Swap Entrance right now, because I have to go make time to go do that now at the start of the next three-day cycle uh, down the line, to be completely honest with you. It is one of the few things I always get kind of my wires crossed on in the game, and hey, I'm human, there's always going to be something. Also, that was a fairy. They do the usual thing. High HD restorative, but they can also revive you from death. Play the Sonata of Awakening on this platform to open up the dungeon.
I honestly really like that you actively have to make the dungeons appear in some form in this game compared to a lot of the other ones where they're just sort of there to begin with. It really adds a layer to this world that I really like. That's always kind of tight feeling. Welcome to the first dungeon. I love Woodfall Temple. Its music's not exactly the most memorable, but I, I think it's a very strong dungeon. Uh, in fact, in general, I think Majora's Mask probably has some of my favorite dungeons in the series, period. With that said, that's our first stray fairy. Uh, every dungeon in the game has 15 stray fairies hidden within it that you need to find in order to restore the other great fairies that the great fairy in Clock Town was talking about. In fact, you actually could find the great fairy fountain for these great fairies. Uh, more or less just behind where the owl statue was. Uh, you need to use a deck of flower to get up to it, but you can't. And this is where the Great Fairy's Mask really comes in handy. There's our second one, by the way. In that, whenever you're in a room with a stray fairy and you equip the Great Fairy's Mask, the hair will glow and alight you there's one in the room. On top of that, in the case that a stray fairy is actively out in the open and can be collected, if you equip the stray fairy mask, uh, the Great Fairy Mask, rather, it'll actively fly into you. Ah, that stench. This place stinks just like that poison swamp. Well, then let's take care of it. Isn't it a Deku Baba? It looks a little withered. Just kind of, you should at least get a Deku stick from it. Uh, that's something, that's me showing off more or less that Tattle does the same thing that Navi did in the last game, where you can get little strategies for enemies and all that. In fact, a uh, little bit of a funny detail. If it's an enemy that was also in Ocarina of Time, there's a very good chance she'll be like, why the hell don't you know what this is, kind of deal. That's it, make sure you cue the Deku Baba right there, because that's where the third stray fairy is, and the fourth one's very close by, it is in the pot in the corner right here. By and large, the stray fairies aren't super annoying to collect. There's only, like, really one instance where you actually have to go back into the dungeon after clearing it uh, to get them all. For the most part, they're pretty streamlined about getting them all. With that said, being a Zelda dungeon, we got the usual suspects in here. Including small keys. Use it to open a locked door. You can use the key only in this dungeon. Uh, this is something I really find interesting about Majora's Mask, and that, by and large, it is... Of course, an Ocarina of Time sequel, because it's directly the same Link and all that. But even, like, difficulty-wise, I'd say this game starts at about the early adult Link dungeons in terms of actual difficulty. They're not so much as long as some of those dungeons, admittedly, but that's because we have a literal timer at all times on screen, so they had to play around with that idea a little bit. I actually have a distinct memory of this room getting a game over in it because I was here during the final six hours, and, uh, whoops. Uh, that was on one of my very early playthroughs. I probably should actually note that very as well, by the way. Uh, Ocarina of Time actively counted your deaths on the menu screen. I think this game does it as well, but an old, the, uh, a game over in this game isn't a death and losing all your health. It's actually letting the timer run out. Uh, if you lose all your hearts, yeah, you die, but you just kind of get sent back to the start of the area you're in. Not too punishing. Our goal in this room, though, is to take out all the snappers, way to kill them, get into Deku Flower, and then pop out when they're above you. And killing them all will make a chest appear. Oh, almost on top of it. Almost did that. You found the dungeon map. Press start to open the subscreens and view the map screen. Areas in the map that appear in blue are the places you visited. Your current location is the flashing area. Use the analog stick to view another floor. Maps work the same way they did in Ocarina, you get to see the individual areas. Woodfall Temple, as you can see here, is not a very large dungeon. We've technically already explored about a fourth of it, honestly. I know I just said the dungeons in this game take about the difficulty of the early Adult Link dungeons in Ocarina to start, but I'd say it more accurate. This is probably about the difficulty of Jabu Jabu's Belly. There's some confusing ideas and some puzzles that might take a second, but it's not too bad. Uh, be careful of the water in here, by the way. It is poison, so you do take damage, but if you are on these lily pads in particular as anything but Deku Link, you actively get eaten by them uh, and take some damage, so watch out. You want to skip across the water in this room. This looks pretty light. Well, don't just stand there. Press A to grab it and then use the analog stick to move it. We want to skip across the water, though, because we want to move it in a specific way to make the puzzle in here a little easier. And we also want to kill the Skullchilla over here because it does contain a stray fairy. So, I think it's about time I actually finally get into my history with Majora's Mask. I didn't get this game at launch because I was three. Uh, but notably, we didn't have it in the house when I was very young either. We had A Link to the Past, we had Zelda 1, we had Ocarina, but we didn't have this. 
I first saw this in a mall GameStop about 2000, uh, let's say 2003 or 4. And I was like, ooh, a Zelda game on the N64 I didn't know about, and we picked it up. Uh, but my brother was there with us, and when he noticed that I had bought that, he was concerned because he was like, ah, I, I didn't like that game because apparently he had rented it or something. Because he didn't like the time mechanic. And admittedly, on my first run, I didn't either. The time mechanic is very overwhelming on a first playthrough. And even on a second playthrough. It really does take a lot of time to get used to, but if you actively get used to it and use the inverse song of time especially, it is such a unique experience that it creates that it's really worth going through. And I've just kind of played the game again and again and again since. In this room, by the way, we actually need to use the Deku Sticks as a torch to light some other torches. Uh, but notably, you do actively have to roll pretty quickly and move quickly in here because otherwise the Deku Sticks do burn out. And I only have three of them, so I need to make sure I keep them around as much as I can. I think if you light a Deku Stick, uh, or use a Deku Stick to light a torch, it's timer resets? At least that's what it feels like, at least in one room down the line. So you don't have to worry too much, but be quick all the same. But yeah, if memory serves though, I didn't actively beat this game until I think uh, maybe even after Twilight Princess was out, or at least well after I had beaten Wind Waker, uh, which would have been about 2005 or 6. But something about beating the game the first time just really made this game stick with me more and more and more. To the point where, uh, oh, I should probably should talk about what we're getting in this particular treasure chest. We're getting the other part of the usual trifecta for Zelda Dungeons. The compass. Now many of the dungeon's hidden things will appear on the map. And by that they mean treasure chests. Pretty much straight up. There's not many treasure chests. It also shows where the boss is. You don't have to worry about a lot. Otherwise I was saying. Uh, I think I even talked about this years back in LPs. I don't recommend going back to watch because I was in high school and that's a little shit. Uh, this is a game I usually play at least once a year. At least I try to. But in particular in like junior and senior year of high school, and I think even freshman year of college. I actively played this game through multiple times in a week. Uh, particularly like spring break of those two years of high school. I played the game like two or three times in a row each because I just was, I, I didn't have enough. I wanted more. And I think I did the same into at least early college. I know for a fact in my first semester of college, I had a history of game development course because I originally went to college for game design. Uh, and... Our homework for that class was usually just doing a little game review. Like, they gave us a little template to be like, alright, talk about what works in this game, what does this, what does that. Be careful, I sense a lot of evil in here. Uh, and here we got some enemies called bows, by the way. They are little spirits that just jump at you, but we want to kill them all in order to light the room up. Uh, but yeah, we had a little game review as homework. Uh, and they were separated by console generation. Like, we did one for, like, the Atari generation. Uh, I think the NES generation. Then we went straight to... Uh, I forget if we went to Super Nintendo after that, or we went to, like, Super Nintendo N64, and then we did GameCube, PS2, Wii Gen. Like, we, we, I think we just started doubling up the generations and some of them. But for the N64 Generation 1, I did this. And let me tell you, being able to say I played a Zelda game as homework is <laughs> fantastic. I also did Resident Evil 4 uh, for one of those assignments, if memory serves. Same with uh, Batman on the NES. That's actually why that LP exists that I did. Yeah, we don't want to kill everything in that room because that spawns that stray fairy. And I think you can light the room up first, actually. Uh, before doing that, it just makes spotting the bows a bit easier. But, uh, yeah, we just got that a little backwards. Have to light the room up to actually get out of here. Now, if memory serves, this next room is pretty important in the 3DS version. Now, they actively moved one of the stray fairies uh, from the room before the compass into here. It's like in the top right corner, I think, if you go down to the floor portion. With that said, be careful here, because you might notice there's some holes in the floor uh, near the deck of flowers. And if you fall into the holes, you actually fall back into the central room. Uh, and we just, I mean, just have to do like another minute to backtrack back here. And hey, that's wasted time, and I'm not about that shit. Usually. Uh, another weird change of memory service about this room in the 3DS version. Uh, the platforms here are always moving in the N64 version, but in the 3DS version, they only move when you get on them, and uh, that does make this room a lot easier. Uh, but it was a weird change, and I did not like it. Because I am a Majora's Mask purist, clearly. Nah, that's only half true. <laughs> like I've said, Majora's Mask 3D had some really good changes. And more save points was one of them. Uh, but also some that were just kind of like, why? 
In fact, we're actually coming up technically on one of the most important differences when we get to the end of the dungeon, but I'll talk more about that when we get to a certain thing. Mmm, that sound design. Always loved that sound effect whenever enemies die. Not every enemy does it, but a lot do. And even though I don't go out of my way to kill a lot of enemies in this game, unless they're actively in my way, always satisfying. Always satisfying. Also, this place from memory actively got like a bit of a lighting overhaul in the 3DS version to be a little more purple. Uh, I think that's in my memory. I might be just confusing that with the rest of the swamp, though. Look, from up here we have a better view of that shrine below. Indeed we do, and we can actually press this switch now, which will cause two ladders to appear, giving us an easier route up to the top floor. Uh, notably, you may have even seen there, Deku Link is lighter than Hylian Link, and thus you can't actively press down a lot of switches. That will actively come more into play in one of the later dungeons. For now, though, we want to come back towards where we got the first small key, actually, because now we can access this room over here, from the second floor. The mini boss of the Woodfall Temple is the good old Dinalfos. Uh, spelled completely different in this game from memory. Yeah, Dinalfos. Don't you know about the Dinalfos? Use targeting methods and defending. Watch out for its fiery breath. It's more or less the same mini boss that we had back in Dodongo's Cavern, uh, back in Ocarina. They will actively try to avoid you. I think the only thing they really have at is I think the Fire Breath attack is completely new. Because I guess they are technically different than Lizzle Foles, but oh uh, well. Uh, notably, be careful if you're fighting this thing as the Deku Link for some reason, because fire attacks against Deku Link actively make you void out and start the room over. Uh, so be careful with that. Uh, with that said, as you can see, Dino Falls, uh, they don't got a lot of health, despite being a mini boss, because they're more or less just a larger enemy variant, so not very hard. By and large, the other dungeons have usually more unique mini bosses. But now we've got the hero's bow. Set it to C to equip. Press C to draw it. Press and hold C to aim. Release C to shoot. What was the dungeon item of the fourth dungeon in Ocarina of Time is now the first dungeon item, and the bow and arrow is essential in this game. It's one of those items that is almost always on one of my three C buttons inside of that of the Ocarina. And it allows you to hit things from a good distance, as well as penetrate through thick enemy shells like Skulltulas. Notably, like Ocarina of Time uh, 3D, the 3DS version actively added a little element to the bow where you can actively, like, get a better idea of where you're aiming due to a little of texture they added to it. On top of that, they also added a reticle to the snot bubble, the Majora, not the Majora, uh, the Deku Mask can shoot out, so aiming in general is a little easier in 3DS. On top of gyroscope controls that some people like, I'm not one of them. I dislike gyro controls for aiming in basically anything. It's why I actively haven't played any of the other Splatoons after the first one. But that allows us to get over here and enter this room. Where now we have a gecko, and it's pretty angry. It's pretty weak too, and it really shouldn't be making a fool out of you. This is sort of the secondary mini boss of the area. Uh, best strategy here. Uh, shoot it with an arrow. Uh, it does try to come up to you and do kind of a 1-2-3 combo that you can get locked into, but as long as you're moving, you don't have to really worry about it. That is until it calls a friend. It's a snapper. The way these things move, they never expose the weakest part of their body. You might remember the first room we fought these in earlier in this dungeon. Now we have to do the same thing against this one. Get in the deck of flower, wait for it to be above you, and then uh, just knock it off the... the knock off the gecko. And at that point, the gecko will try to run around. I think fire some projectiles at you and occasionally try to get back on the snapper. Uh, just shoot it with an arrow, and the pattern will now repeat because you can't hit it more than once. At least if you can, you have to be very precise about it. This mini boss isn't hard, I just find it more annoying than anything at this point because it moves at just a fast enough rate to be annoying to hit from certain angles. And uh, as many times as I've played this game, I've been in some very annoying angles with it. With that said, as long as you're not like rapid firing your arrows at every opportunity, you shouldn't have to worry about running out of ammo with this fight, especially because usually whenever you knock it off the snapper, uh, it drops an arrow. And in some instances, you can actively pick it up when you land because of just some nice angle stuff. It also doesn't have a lot of health, so don't worry too much. The gecko's a frog. 
Weird. And that might come into play later, call it a hunch. But now we have access to a very different looking chest that contains the same thing these chests contained in the Adult Dungeons in Ocarina. Within here is the third member of the trifecta that's been present in Zelda since A Link to the Past. It is the boss key. Now you can enter the chamber where the boss lurks. Cool. Yeah, as you might be able to tell by some fact, we've already got the boss key and uh, we've got most of the stray fairies. This dungeon isn't very long because of the timer once again. Dungeons of Majora's Mask make up for length and usually the complexity of the puzzles and back and forth they want you to do. And it's the point where if you know them very well, you can get them done very efficiently. I don't think there's a single dungeon in this game that can't be cleared in, say, a single 12-hour section of a day, barring if you didn't enter it uh, at, like, the halfway point of one. Uh, if you know your way around this game, it's very quick to get through a lot of stuff. But that said, before we head to the boss, we actually have to hunt down the rest of these stray fairies. We still have six to go now that we have that ninth one. And one of them is actually in this very room, I think even two. Because the thing about arrows as well, they can be lit on fire by shooting them through fire, which you can use to light up other torches. Not that there's many times you have to do that in the game from memory, I can only think of like... four or five offhand. Uh, at least shooting them through torches. There's other times I'll have to light torches up, but we'll have other ways to do that down the line. With that said, now that this platform's up here, we can light that other torch on fire, which I believe opens up the door towards the boss arena. But there's also a switch over there we're going to want to press because you might notice there's a chest on the map. On top of the fact there's a stray fairy we actively couldn't get earlier. Uh... Without the bone arrow, which I think is the one they moved in the 3DS version. I think they actually moved another one in here, uh, but they kept it in the same room. I think it was actually the previous room, uh, where we the, the room between the snappers, the geckos, and the dino falls. I think they moved the one that's on the wall in that area that we got earlier on in the dungeon to the second floor, and you can only really get it up there. I think I might be wrong about that. It's actually been a hot minute since I played Ocarina of Time, uh, Majora's Mask 3D, rather. Uh, I think my last full run was... That well, was a while ago, actually. I can't remember a specific date. It's actually weird to think. I think... How old is Majora's Mask 3D now? Uh, 2015. So that's eight years old this year. Ooh. Mmm, I don't like that time's passing. Ew, stop it. As annoying as some of them are to backtrack for, I honestly really do like stray fairies as a concept for the dungeons in this game. And I kind of wish they would bring them back in some form. Uh, because obviously they're not needed to beat the game. Uh, unless you're going for 100% like I always do in Zelda games. But they give, us so they give you something extra to do in a dungeon that's just a little bit of a thing on the side. Like, kill this enemy, you find this little extra thing. There's a little guy over there if you destroy that thing. It gives another reason besides getting ammunition to interact with parts of the dungeon that aren't the direct puzzles, and I like that a lot. With that said, uh, the rewards are also very good, so it's worth it for that alone, too. Uh, mind you, I guess that's another thing, like, the rewards we get for getting the Stray Fairies in Zelda games otherwise are usually gotten through other methods. So that's probably why some other games haven't brought them back, barring the remake of this very game. I just think it'd be neat if we got, like, another Majora's Mask-esque game for another game that could do some concepts again, like, from... Eh. Could use some concepts again from this. There we go. So yeah, Bone Arrow? You take out Skull is no problem. With that said, uh, all of the remaining stray fairies are in this room, and there are a lot of them, because you might notice on the map there's, like, five little offshoots on the bottom of the map. Uh, I think like three of them are nested in those little inlets. Uh, and there's some of them, some of them I think are st stacked double high, so you kind of have to just go back and forth until you find the right one. That right there is sort of the main puzzle of this room. You need to use the bone arrow to hit that crystal switch to lower those fires, but that is timed and they do come back up. It's actually one of the few time switches in the game I can think of that doesn't actively have like the timer sound effect that was in Dungeons, I think, in Majora's Mask as early as... I think at the least, the Dongo's Cavern? I forget if it was in any of the ones earlier than that. So make sure you actively take care of that switch when you're actively going to be going after those flames. 
It is interesting, kind of looking back, though. Like, I was a kid, this dungeon overwhelmed me, because a lot of things overwhelmed me in this game. But nowadays, I think this might be one of the few dungeons in this game, or in Zelda games, period, I just can completely autopilot through, even while, like, in-depth in a conversation with someone, because I usually do play a little games a little worse when I'm talking and playing at the same time. It's actually why I do post-commentary. Also, the bubbles, you don't need to turn into High Lane Link to get the Stray Fairies out of them. You can just attack them with whatever. You found all the Stray Fairies. Quick, take them to the nearby Great Fairy. And there is a part of me that says you should go do that right now, because it's not hard to get back into the temple or get back to this room after that. I just always do the boss first, because... The boss of this dungeon's not a big deal, with or without the upgrade you get from the Great Fairy. So don't worry too much. There are also some rupees you can get in this room, which uh, I guess if you're super worrying about min-maxing your rupee intake, you could go get. I am not, because I have better methods of getting rupees pretty quickly that we can actively do now that we have even just the bow and arrow. So, yeah. With that said, once we take this flower over to the far side of the room, it's time for the dungeon boss, which is where the biggest change in every dungeon is in the 3DS version. I'll talk about that in a moment, though. If you get close to him, you'll get beaten. You understand me? That is Adolwa's main thing. He's got a large sword and knows how to use it. He has several sword attacks, including a very long-reaching stab, a long-reaching swipe, and all that. And even if you take, just run into it, you take damage. With that said, Adolwa will use his shield to guard unless you use the bow and arrow or the Deku spin to stun him. You can also use bombs for this if you manage to buy them by this point. Uh, once you've stunned him, go for whatever attack you got. Uh, the spin attack, I think you can technically combo with him. Uh, him with, rather, and the jump attack's also pretty good because it does the most damage of what you got. Uh, this boss isn't a lot to worry about because there's a lot of ways you can stun him. He can summon some enemies, though, uh, namely some moths, a couple little beetle guys and all that, so watch out. With that said, this boss was completely changed in the 3DS version to take advantage of the deck of flower in the center of the arena. In a way that I actually kind of like. <laughs> Every enemy he spawns, you can kill with just a simple sword swipe, by the way. Uh, he can kind of jump out of the way, which is also kind of annoying, but oh well. But in the 3DS version, you actively had to use the Deku flowers around the arena to fly up and send a bomb down with the Deku nut onto his head because he had a Majora's Mask eye on the back of his head in the 3DS version. At that point, you would stun him, and then you can just go all in attacking his head until he dies. The 3DS version boss changes, I think, range from really fun, like this and the third boss, to really annoying in the case of the fourth boss. It's actually one of the main reasons I'm playing the N64 version, because I don't like that fourth boss's changes. As you can see, he doesn't got a lot of health either. But we now have a little more. We got a heart container. Your maximum life energy is increased by one heart. You also get a full refill of life energy. Now we're up to six hearts. Hell yeah. But that's not all we get. We get his mask. You've seized Adolwa's remains. You've just freed the innocent spirit that this dark mask had kept in prison within the body of evil Adolwa.
listen. It seems to be saying something. Could that crying be its way of teaching us some sort of melody? D don't just stand there. Get your instrument. Could this be the song? You learned the oath to order. Callus, that's what it's saying. The swamps have been purified. But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching. And in part five, we go explore Southern Swamp now that its poison has been cleared. See you guys then.